Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. So my name is Henry Kilpatrick, and I am the Managing Director of Institutional Advancement here at Jackson State. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to say welcome to everyone in the room that is back for, this is number three. And uh, for those of you that have not joined us before, welcome to Jackson State. We also have a live stream, so I would be amiss if I did not say welcome to our everyone tuning in. So um, to kick things off, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Tennessee Board of Regent member, Nisha, Regent Nisha Powers. Regent, uh, Regent Powers was appointed by Governor Bill Lee to serve as the ninth congressional district representative. She is president of Powers Hill Design LLC, a civil engineering firm that established in 2005, located in downtown Memphis. Regent Powers, thank you for being with us today and for leading today's forum. Thank you so much. I'll turn that mic on, thank you. Thanks, Henry. And again, thank you everyone for being here today in person, online, if you're watching, thank you for engaging um, as we search for Jackson State's next president. And I'm going to be very cognizant of our time here today. Um, so we're going to stick to one hour on this open forum. And uh, during the forum, Dr. Lopez, we will have, you'll have the opportunity to provide a brief overview and um, speak about your higher education experience, uh, qualifications, why um, you're interested in this job of being the president of Jackson State Community College. And um, then after your remarks, we'll go into a question and answer session. So please. All right, let me make sure I'm on. Can you all hear me? All right, wonderful, good afternoon. So my name is Dr. Jennifer Lopez. Um, I'm currently the Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Jackson State. Um, but I do wanna give you a little bit of a background uh, into my educational uh, experience. Um, I'm from North Carolina originally, and I got my undergraduate degree at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in Romance Languages and Literature. So I speak Spanish and Portuguese. Um, I went on at Chapel Hill to continue my education, and I got a master's degree also in Romance Languages. So again, in Spanish and Portuguese languages and literature. Um, after I finished my education, my master's degree, I sort of went into the workforce. i uh, tell you a little bit of a story about how I fell into the community college. I am a first generation college student. Um, I didn't go to the community college, as I just told you. I did go to a four-year college. Um, but shortly after I finished my master's degree, uh, I fell on hard times. So I didn't get my doctorate right away. I was married. Um, my husband at the time finished his doctorate and I just decided to stop and I was going to be the primary caretaker of our children. Um, and at that time, the marriage kind of fell apart. And so we separated and I was a single mom with a one-year-old and I was four months pregnant. And so I was at the lowest I thought I'd ever be. I was really scared. I didn't have a job, I didn't have any money, and I didn't have a support system because my mother and father had just moved to Dallas, Texas for my dad's job. So distraught, I called my parents and my parents said, well, this is great, you speak Spanish, you'll get a job in Dallas, no problem. So uh, my uncle came to the house and packed me up, helped me sell all our stuff, put the house on the market, and we drove to Dallas little side story. Um, this was 20 years ago. When I came here to interview for the vice president of academic affairs job, my parents and my family back home in North Carolina called me and they're like, what do you think of Jackson? Do you like it? Do you like the town? What do you think of Jackson State? Do you like the people? And my uncle went, well, she's been there before. And I was like, I have. And he was like, that's where you spent the night on the way to Dallas. So 20 years ago, I actually spent the night in Jackson, Tennessee on my way to Dallas. And I just didn't even think 20 years from then, I'd be here at this particular place and moment in time, uh, working for such a great institution. 
So I got to Dallas and I had my master's degree. I had taught a couple of classes as an adjunct faculty member at the community college and I liked it. And I thought that might be a good fit for me. And so I applied. I applied to be an instructional specialist three in foreign languages at Richland College in Dallas County Community College. And I got the job and they, they took a chance on me despite the fact that I told them, hey, I'm four months pregnant and I'm going to need eight weeks off once we get to the holiday break. Um, but they decided to give me a chance. And as soon as I walked into that, that community college, I felt at home. Uh, the connection was so strong. The community was so strong and the support was so strong, um, not just for our students, but for me. Uh, I was 29 years old and living at home with my parents, you know, with a one-year-old and four months pregnant, and I didn't feel judged at all. I felt accepted, and I felt welcomed, and I felt supported, and I started to understand what that kind of support and that community means to people who need that extra strength to move forward and be successful and overcome obstacles and challenges in their life to make their life better. So it really helped me understand uh, kind of where our students are coming from and the importance of community. I never got that at Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill was a wonderful education, I'm not gonna lie, but the sense of community was never the same as it was at the community college. When I was at the community college in Dallas, I was very fortunate because of my language skills. I, made a, I got to make a huge impact on the Hispanic community. I worked very closely with the Hispanic community there, mainly in helping students understand how to get to college. Uh, that involved a lot of trans translation work, um, particularly for FAFSA and application materials, and just basically letting um, the Hispanic population know that they can, they can do it, si se puede, right, is what I taught them. And that was amazing. Um, after Dallas, my father retired and um, moved back to the Carolinas, and so the girls and I decided to follow suit so we could be closer to family while they were still young. Uh, and so I applied for a job as a Spanish faculty member at Piedmont Technical College in Greenwood, South Carolina. And that was even better than Dallas. And let me tell you why, because it was the same sense of community, that same sense of support, that same sense of like, I don't know, just compassion and being able to help people. But this time I got to see my students in the community. In Dallas, I would go to Walmart or Target. You didn't know anybody right? So you could walk into Walmart in pajamas, no one would know who you were. But in Greenwood, South Carolina, which is very similar to Jackson, Tennessee, I got to see my students out in the community. I got to interact with them. I got to meet them at a personal level, see what their, meet their families, see what some of their struggles were, and also see how what we were doing helped change their lives. I got to see that in real life, right? Out in the real world, outside of the walls of the college. And that was amazing. That was such an amazing experience. And by that point, I was sold. The community college, I was blessed, found me. The community college found me. And I didn't ever want to leave the community college again, right? When I left Piedmont Technical College, I did have an opportunity to work with community college students and help them transfer in to a four-year program. Um, let me back up a little bit. I guess at Piedmont Technical College, I was a faculty member. Um, from there, I moved up to chair of the humanities in the English departments. And I also was the QEP director um, for our QEP project at Piedmont Technical College. I left Piedmont Technical College for an opportunity uh, to be a dean at Lee's McCray College, which is a private liberal arts college in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And that was set up, it was an online program, Dean of Online Learning, and it was a two plus two program. And it was to help community college students transfer in to an online program so that they can complete their bachelor's degree. And that was a great experience. And I did some wonderful things there. Namely, I helped a four-year understand what it means to come from a two-year, right? Sometimes they don't always speak the same language particularly the programs that we were offering were um, the student were, were applied science programs and they needed to understand that's not the same as a liberal arts degree. But the more I tried to connect with the students and with the community and with the business leaders and the industry leaders, it just wasn't the same. It wasn't the same feeling. Um, so I just knew I had to go back to the community college. Uh, and that's when I found Jackson. 
Jackson, Tennessee. And I came here and I interviewed and I just loved it. it again, it reminds me of home. It's the same size as Greenwood. Uh, the community college has the same number of uh, enrolled students. And I have, um, Jackson for me has already become home. Tomorrow, well, first of all, today's 7-3 one day. So I hope everyone goes out and enjoys Porch Fest tonight. And I think that brings good luck because it represents Jackson State for me. And tomorrow is my first year anniversary to be here in Jackson and at Jackson State Community College. And within one year, I feel like this is home. This is my community. This is my college. These are my people, right? This is my family. And um, so those have been my experiences that led me here this, thus far. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, and you nailed it on the time. So beautifully done. Appreciate hearing your story. <laughs> and we're going to move into the question and answer session. Okay. Um, and I do want to say that the questions were submitted by community members and faculty and staff. And in reviewing those and preparing for today, they're just so thoughtfully done. I was telling Heather earlier, just that uh, the questions I was timing, you see. Um, <laughs> So, uh, excuse me for that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just really appreciate the thoughtfulness of those questions. And I think that'll help you tell your story even better. So um, I'm going to ask these questions and uh, the time frame. probably, I think Henry's going to help us sort of keep track so we don't get carried away and have too much fun. <laughs> um, so I will start uh, with the first question. <laughs> this is, um, how do you see yourself being involved in our community? so that you as a new president become the face of Jackson State Community College and the community? Well, I'm glad y'all are timing me. First of all, you must have talked to them ahead of time because they all know now that I like to talk. Uh, so I'm glad someone is timing me. Uh, it would be my honor, um, my absolute honor, and I would feel so blessed to be the face of Jackson State Community College uh, and be able to share our story with the community. I think that we're doing wonderful things here and those aren't being communicated uh, enough to, to the community. Um, my plan would be as president is to engage with the community right away. Um, from day one, I would send out a communication, draft a communication, share some social media, introduce myself to the community and get out and start meeting with community leaders and community stakeholders. Um, I've already been doing a little bit of that over this past year. Uh, working with um, local leaders, I've been able to go out not only in Jackson, but in the 10 counties that we serve. I've met with various mayors. Um, I've met Representative Johnny Shaw. I've met uh, Senator Jackson. Um, I've also met with a lot of our school superintendents in the 10 counties that we serve to talk about dual enrollment opportunities in middle colleges. I've worked quite a bit with the chamber and uh, with local business leaders, uh, 6K uh, about all the industry opportunities that are coming to West Tennessee and talking about how we can meet their needs to, to uh, provide that skilled workforce. So it's really important right now to go out, first of all, and introduce myself, start building these relationships, listen to the community, listen to what it is that they, they need, listen to their wants, listen to ways that we can help serve the community and better meet the needs of the community, but at the same time, tell our story. I think it's very important to tell our story and let them know that we're gonna be the three Ds. We're gonna be different, dynamic, and dependable. Thank you. So in your career, Dr. Lopez, what have you done to celebrate the accomplishments of your team? and while also ensuring that others rise to the standards that you have set? Um, well, uh, maybe I might rephrase that, rise to standards. Uh, I think we meet standards, right? If we have expectations, those are, exp those are expected, right? So people should meet expectations. Uh, when we talk about meeting expectations, I think one of the most important things we need to do is set those clear expectations, right? What is it that we are expecting of, of our faculty and staff and even students, right? Because they're not gonna be successful if you don't set those expectations. Once you set those expectations, I think it's really important to provide people with support and guidance and resources. We shouldn't just throw out expectations and expect people to 
to be successful on their own, particularly if that's never been asked of them before. So faculty, staff, and students need to have resources, guidance, support. Um, and then I think that there's a level of accountability, right? If we have expectations, um, people need to be held accountable to make sure that they are meeting those certain expectations. And, and it's the people, it's the faculty, staff, and students that rise above the expectations, they for certainly should be celebrated. Um, and I like to celebrate those um, people who do the little extra effort that go a little above and beyond um, with a lot of gratitude. I think it's very important to recognize and acknowledge the work that people do, the hard work that they do, their values and their contributions to the college. Let's face it, everything that y'all do here at the college is what makes the college what it is. It wouldn't run without faculty, staff, and students, right? So your work is valuable to what we do here. Um, and when people work, and particularly when people do that, go the extra mile, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of a simple thank you. It's so important to thank people so that they feel valued, respect it, and appreciate it. I also think it's important to give credit when people are working hard. And, and they're doing wonderful things for the college. And that credit should be given to people publicly, right? So we can all share and celebrate in what those people are doing and, and celebrate that person. Um, and then I think when possible, we should be able to give awards or rewards. And sometimes, you know, ideally that would be financial incentives, but sometimes we don't always have financial incentives. So other things that we could do are, um, you know, certificates, plaques, awards for the most innovative faculty member or the award for the most, um, you know, uh, innovative staff member, anything like that, just to show our recognition and that we value our faculty staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So like the ones that ask for specific details, so I'm going to start with this. I'm going to get out of order a little bit. Tell us about a pivotal time in your career where you rolled up your sleeves and got into the trenches with your employees, what was the outcome? Uh, that was a year ago today, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> that was my first day at Jackson State, uh, August 1st, 2022. Um, my first day at work here at Jackson State, I rolled up my sleeves and they're still rolled up. Um, when I got here by the first 30 days, by the end of August, uh, I had to have a referral report written to turn into SACS. Within the first 60 days, we had to have the strategic plan developed and written to present to TBR and to the college. And within the first 120 days, we had to revamp the schedule and look at all of our contact hours and our course sequencing and enrollment. So we hit the ground running. Um, me, the faculty, the deans, the chairs, uh, Dr. Nelms from the Office of Institutional Research and Accountability, staff, the administrative assistants, everybody had to get on board to make these things happen in a very short amount of time. And our my sleeves are still rolled up. There is so much more to do at this college because the potential is so great. The opportunity is so great. There's so much more we can do um, that I'm not done working. <laughs> uh, I guess it's job security, yeah. Um, but I love one thing I do love about Jackson State, and and I sing the praises all the time, is that I feel like here, um, faculty and staff are passionate also about the college, and they want to work hard for their college and for their community. Um, when I first got here, I saw that right away when I interviewed. I saw that, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, there's a lot of changes that need to be made. But in everybody I met, they were gung-ho and ready to do it. They were on board. They came to me and said, yeah, we got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of changes to be made. Let's do it. And, and I think that's a real strength of this college and something that y'all should be really proud of. Okay, thank you. So Jackson and West Tennessee are on a cusp of an economic boom much like what we've seen in other parts of the state. Tell us how you are prepared to lead the college during this pivotal time to ensure that we are positioned as a forefront leader in post-secondary education. 
Also, have you experienced something like that in your career before? <laughs> Um, it is an interesting time and it's an exciting time for us. And I think what we need to do is we need to be, um, we need to look at our North Stars. First and foremost, we need to be the three Ds. We've got to be different, dynamic, and independable. If Jackson State's going to be at the forefront of all of these changes and all of these opportunities, economic opportunities that are coming this way, we've got to do things differently than we did in the past, right? Education has changed. Post-pandemic, education's in a new paradigm. It's a new reality, and we can't continue to do the things that we used to do. We're going to have to make those changes so that we're, we're current with the new trends and what's going on in education today in the 21st century after uh, post-pandemic. We're also going to need to be dynamic, and dynamic means we have to be innovative, and we have to take risks, right? And we have to be willing to take those risks and not be afraid to fail. Right. And that's one of the things I tell my faculty and my deans all the time. Don't be afraid to fail. Right. You have permission to fail. The only thing is, is you got to fail and fail fast. Right. And once you fail, don't do that again. Right. Try something else. Right. But we don't want to be scared to try new things because that's how we're going to be cutting edge. That's how we're going to be innovative. And that's how we learn. Right. That's how we learn. We also have to be dependable. And this is hard work. I told the faculty in January, this is hard work. In fall, when we came in with a vision for academic affairs, here's the vision. This is what we're going to do, right? We have it all lined up. In spring, when I came in and talked to the faculty, I said, guess what? All that plans, we're going to do it now. And that's when it gets challenging. This is when the rubber hits the road, right? But this is when we have to press the accelerator. We can't let off the accelerator because this is where change happens. And you know what? Because we said to the community that we would do this. And so when we tell the community, when we tell local industry, when we tell business leaders we're going to do something, we have to be dependable and do it. We have to do what we say we're going to do, right? But we also have to be dependable to each other. As a team, we work as a team. We have the same shared vision, the same goals, the same objective, which is to see our students be successful, right? And so we have to work together and be dependable to each other. And that means even when we fail, we give grace, right? We give grace and we support, just like the community college did to me just like we do to our students, we do to each other, right? And we have to be dependable to our students, right? Our students face insurmountable challenges sometimes to get here, right? They overcome obstacles that to, to make it to your class or to come to campus because they have a question or a need and we have to be here for them, right? And that's how we're gonna position ourselves in the future. We're also gonna be forefing thinking in terms of new programs. We have to look at labor uh, demands and job growth right now in Tennessee, West Tennessee, that's particularly education, STEM, CIT, manufacturing, electrical engineering, um, and health sciences. But we also have to look to the future. And the future for us right now is also AI, augmented reality, machine learning, cobotics, um, data science and data analytics, cybersecurity. Uh, those are all things that we have to be looking forward to so that we can be innovative. Um, and did I answer all of it? I feel like I did. I think you did. And I'll kind of um, use that as a transition. You talked about forward thinking mm -hmm. um, and sort of taking risks. So if you had the power to change one thing in higher education, what would it be? And how would you go about implementing that change? I only get one. Just for starters today. Just for starters. <laughs> um, my one thing would be agility, uh, the rate at which things change in education. Um, in industry, industry 4.0, business, education, certificates, um, other ways of getting uh, skills, they're changing at a rapid, rapid, rapid pace. And sometimes I feel like the wheels of education turn very slowly. 
Um, of course, sometimes I have to back up and realize that's for a good reason. We want to make sure that we have quality education and that we're holding ourselves accountable and that we have assessment and we know that we're what we're doing is working. But at the same time, I'd love to be able to get a program up and running in less than a year. Right. If an industry came to see me and said we need this program, I'd certainly like to have it up and running within six months. Uh, that would be great. So how do I see about implementing that change? I think that's one of the roles that a president does. Uh, the president has three major roles, and that is to be an advocate for the college, that is to have financial management, and that's to be the chief fundraiser. So this would fall in line in terms of activist advocacy. And I think that's what presidents do is they work with policymakers to help them understand how education works and, and how the educational system is and what the need is from the industry and how can we work to make some changes to make that process a little bit more flexible and a little more nimble. I also think we're very lucky because we're in a system like TBR that also works together as a collective group to help work with uh, policymakers and legislators to help um, understand why certain changes need to happen at a faster rate within education. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. So. West Tennessee is both urban and rural, and you've talked about that some in your history, and presenting its own set of unique challenges in terms of student recruitment. Mm -hmm. How would you ensure a fair and equitable process across our service areas in terms of community involvement and engagement? Um, well, I think it's really important, again, that we have outreach and we start building relationships and partnerships with members of the different communities in the counties that we serve. Um, one is super important is going out and meeting with the people in the county, listening to them, listening to what their concerns are, what their needs are, um, and what are some of the barriers that they may have in terms of like accessing our education or our, our, our courses. And that's very, very important. And I've been doing some of that already. Um, we've been, we've had industry roundtables at our Lexington campus and at our Savannah campus that have been very fruitful so far. Um, when we met with industry leaders at the Savannah campus, we found out that, you know, they're really expecting a boom in tourism because of Ford and all the growth that's coming to West Tennessee. They're right there on the river. They're thinking about building a hotel and a marina on the river, and they really would benefit from a certificate in hospitality and tourism. Right. When we met with the Lexington campus and the industry leaders there, we found out that there were some really good workforce training opportunities there that we hadn't been attentive to. Uh, and we were able to provide that to them in Lexington counties. Uh, so that's very, very important. We're also meeting with um, I've been meeting with different local policy lead, uh, uh, policy makers and legislatures and mayors. Uh, for example, in, in the change of service area, we are acquiring Gibson County in the Trenton Center. So I immediately went out and met with the mayor of Trenton and asked, you know, what could we do? What are you expecting from the college? What do you need from the college in terms of this center that we're going to open? We're really excited and we want to be able to meet your needs. And one of his biggest needs was childcare. Right. We're losing talent in Trenton because our teachers leave because we don't have anyone to watch their kids. Yeah. Well, that made me start thinking and working with the deans and our chairs and thinking, you know, what we could do is we could re-engineer our early childhood, um, our early childhood certificate, re-engineer it from 21 hours down to 18 hours and embed it into a business degree. Because one thing that's not been very popular about the early childhood certificate is that the pay scale what, or what daycare workers get paid is very low. But if you have a business degree, then you don't have to do that. You can transition to something else, right? Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, right? And you want to open up a child care center in your home, right, while your children are young. So we can give you the certificate that will make you CDA compliant with all the tech to courses. But we're also going to give you nine credit hours of business administration so that you're also on the way to earning your certificate to being a child care program director and you can run your own child care facility, right? And at the end, in the capstone course for the entrepreneur course, have all these students work with our small business director, Edwin, to write a business plan to open up their own child care facility. And that would meet the needs of Trenton, but at the same time, give our students flexibility that 
when they're no longer maybe interested in working in childcare, or maybe they do want to open up their own facility or be a program director and run their own childcare facility, but they also have a business grade that they can go on and do other things. It gives them pathways. And that's what we need to do is give them pathways. So these are ways that we can work with the different communities, meet their needs, you know. Um, but other things too is I feel that they should be really involved in, in college planning and fundraising. Uh, so when we think about strategic planning, of course, we've just gone through a revision of our strategic plan, but coming up in September, we'll be picking a topic for our QEP. I think all of these people should have an opportunity to be at the table and be a part of this planning process. And we can do that through open forums. We can do that through surveys. We can do that through inviting people from our different service area uh, counties to come to the college and work as a think tank or as an advisory council. We can even bring in people from the community from all 10 counties to come in as an advisory council in terms of what programs we need for industry and what kinds of ways can we help fundraise for new programs. Right. So that's they should all be sitting at to have a voice at the table. When we talk about shared governance, I talked about this with the faculty. It's one of their favorite topics. <laughs> um, I think that shared governance is having that voice at the table and the feedback. I think that we do that with our faculty. We do that with our staff and we do a good job at that with our students. But I think shared governance also comes in with our community stakeholders. Right. They should be able to have a little bit of a voice of what we're doing and input. I think we're going to stay on the theme of community. Okay. So community colleges have historically been known as a pillar in their communities. Please provide two to three specific examples of your experiencing experience, including results, building effective partnerships with third party organizations, such as school districts, other colleges, chambers of commerce, local governments, and employers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I get two to three. You get two to three. Two to three. So I bet you'll pick three. <laughs> They've already told you I'm a talker. <laughs> so uh, my first partnership that I'm really proud of was in South Carolina at Piedmont Technical College. And this was working with the West Initiative. So the work ethic skills program that I was over. Uh, work ethic skills are basically another word for soft skills. We didn't use soft because when you tell soft to students, they're like, it's soft. But these are really important skills. And in fact, we did a DACUM. Um, with local industry leaders in South Carolina. A DACUM is a development of a curriculum. We brought in industry leaders from the entire community across all of our seven counties that we serve to come in and say, what is it that our curriculum's not meeting? Where's gaps in our curriculum? And, and, and the industry leaders came back and said, you know what, you're doing a great job. These students have great technical skills. They really understand what they're doing. They've learned the concepts and the content. I just need them to come to work. Right? And I need to come to work on time and I need them to have good communication skills and I need them to have good time management skills and interpersonal skills. And so that would be great if you can include that into your curriculum. So we immediately started setting about um, devising um, curriculum, looking at six different uh, professional skills or work ethic skills that were highlighted as being very important to our local industries and figuring out how we can embed them into the curriculum assess them, and then be able to award students digital badges based on mastery of these, these work ethic skills. And so we had a perfect pilot program to work with, and that was our mechatronics program that through a South Carolina apprenticeship had an apprenticeship program with ZF Transmission. ZF Transmissions is a tier two supplier with BMW in Greenville, South Carolina. And that program works very similar to our AMT co-op program here at Jackson State. So students spent half the time in the classroom and the other half of their time on the plant floor. This was a great opportunity because we could embed it into the classroom, start working on a rubric or an instrument to assess these skills, come up with some criteria, have the faculty work with it with the students, but even better was giving it to the supervisor on the plant floor. Because then we start to calibrate, what are our expectations in terms of work ethic skills, right? Our faculties may look different than what it looks like for a supervisor on the plant floor. So we start calibrating those skills and really fine tuning that instrument Faculty were assessing our students in the classroom, supervisors were assessing, uh, assessing them on the, on the floor. And then what we ended up having was we had a curriculum that was industry recognized and industry backed. 
right? And that was great. So, and they really loved our digital badging system. And so once that took off and we had that, I was able to take it out to a whole bunch of different industry councils, advisory councils, workforce groups, South Carolina Apprenticeship, South Carolina Works, uh, all the school districts and let them know what we were doing. And um, by the end of the tour, if you'll say, I had pretty much almost every industry in the area willing to guarantee a student who got a West badge, guarantee them an interview. Not a job, but an interview, right? They would be guaranteed an interview by the time we were done with this. So it was so successful, we ended up mapping it through 28 of our other programs at Piedmont Technical College. So that was a great uh, partnership with our mechatronics program and our industry and employers in the area. Uh, the second partnership I want to talk about is one with other educational institutions, our sister institutions, if you will. Uh, it's currently, currently in the works right now. Um, what we want to do is to meet the workforce demands, particularly for our local and already existing industries, is we want to partner with the TCAT Jackson and their IMIA program so that those students can seamlessly transfer into our AAS Engineering Systems Technology program and we can take as much credit as possible. So they can pretty much start in, hopefully it would be able to start in their second year of the AAS ENST program. We're working to make that happen. But the exciting thing is, is that we're also talking to UT Martin because they share space in our McWhorter building and working with them to build a bachelor's of applied science and engineering systems technology. So we have the complete pipeline for students right here on Jackson State's campus. They'd be able to go straight from the TCAT to the associates and then into the bachelors of a science, uh, applied science program. Um, and the third example I'd like to give is working with uh, organizations in the community. And um, this is, I also wanna give kudos to Dr. Pick, uh, but this is the JTEC boot camp that we're working on. Um, this is a CIT boot camp. Uh, that's in partnership with Jackson State, uh, the United Way of West Tennessee, the Jackson Chamber of Commerce, and the Jackson Madison County School System. And this is basically designed to uh, target those students who are in high school right now that may not be like your AA plus students, maybe like your C or B students, but they are really tech oriented. They really are interested in, in technology and computers. And they might not have first thought about dual enrollment, but since they're so interested in technology, we want to go ahead and start getting them into a boot camp where they're going to learn some technology skills, right? Possibly a certification, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Pig, um, and definitely be able to PLA some of that credit into credit courses so that they could take dual enrollment classes and start working towards a degree in, in CIT. So that's really, really exciting. Fantastic. So what ways have you streamlined processes and procedures in your career to maximize efficiency and overall outcomes? And tell us what the impact of those changes were. Uh, I have two examples for that. When I was looking, working at Lees McRae College, again, that private four-year school in Western North Carolina, um, that was a liberal arts school. Uh, again, I was working with their online program, the two plus two, and it was to make sure that community college students could transfer into the last two years of their four year degree. Uh, those students, the programs we offered at Lees McRae were criminal justice, human services, the RN to, to BSN, and then um, business. Criminal justice, business, and human services were all uh, applied sciences. Those students came from the community college with an AAS degree. At the time I got to Lee's McRae, they were trying to transfer in and having them work with the, the general education core for the liberal arts college. The programs were at 130, 138 credit hours because those students had to take so many more gen ed classes. And I told them, I said, look, these are AAS degrees. I was like, y'all are actually offering BAS degrees. These are not meant to be liberal arts degrees. These are bachelors of applied science. We want an applied, an associates of applied science to go over to a bachelors of applied science. This is a totally different degree. 
And hence it can have a totally different gen ed core, right? It doesn't need to be as high. It can be as low as 30. That's what SACS recommends. So I took down all of their programs from like 130, 130 credit, 38 credit hours down to 120, which got the students in and out in much quicker time and saved them a whole lot of money, right? And made those programs a lot more attractive to those students plus made the transfer a lot more seamless. So that's one example. Um, here at Jackson State, I think another example I'd like to give is working with um, the Interim Vice President of Student Services, uh, Corey Ebenhack, about the whole um, purge process and the never attend. Um, right now, up to this point, it seems like that process has not been very efficient. Uh, students have been entered, enrolled into courses, and then purged, and then enrolled, and then purged, and enrolled, and then purged. And so working with uh, Vice President Evan Hack and with John and financial aid and with the business office, we have come up with a clear timeline in which there'll be set times for students to be purged for non-payment, and then a timeline and a deadline for students to be dropped for never attend. And, and those dates are fixed, so we won't have so much churn between the students enrolling and being perched. Thank you. So I have two more questions, mm -hmm. um, and we have about 15 minutes. Okay. Honesty is the best policy. Sounds like my mom talking. <laughs> but what about communication? Tell us how you utilize transparency in your communication among direct reports and the campus. Um, I think my direct reports could attest to the fact that I, I'm pretty honest and pretty transparent, um, even if it's good, bad, or ugly sometimes, right? Uh, I think that's very, very important. Honesty is always the best policy, and transparency builds trust. It shows that I, I value enough, I trust you enough, and I respect you enough to share this information with you. Uh, and that's very important because uh, when you communicate and when you're transparent, it, 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 it does so many things, right? I, and I, I apologize for those of you who have talked to me throughout the day. I'm going to repeat myself. But communication is so, so, so important. Let's just start there, right? Um, and I know that even myself can always use improvement in communication, right? I mean, I think I communicate enough, but then you realize, nope, it's never enough. You can never communicate too much right? You can never communicate too much. Sometimes things happen, things move fast, you get in the weeds and you think, ah, I didn't make, I didn't communicate or I should have communicated better. And I recognize that's an area of improvement um, that I can always be focused on and work on. Um, but communication is vitally important, particularly when we talked about before about teamwork and morale. Uh, there you go. It's all about, it's all about communication. So the transparency builds the trust, right? But if Scott trusts me and I trust Scott, that's great. Doesn't mean we're on the same team yet, right? All it means is like, I trust him, he trusts me. What makes us part of the same team? A shared vision, shared values, and a shared goal, right? Now we trust each other and we're on the same team because we have the same goals and we're moving in the same direction, right? Inherently, people want to know, where are we going? That's the vision. Why are we going there? Right? That's the goals. That's the data. That's the transparency. And the next big question is, how are we getting there? Right? And what that does is, not only does it solidify teamwork, because we're all moving in the same direction, right? But it also, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> it also makes sure it's, it helps you see the big picture. That's what it like. If y'all all should be able to see the big picture. When we see the big picture of where the college is at the moment, right? It helps you orient. Okay. Where are we in terms of our goals? Here we are. Right. This is where we need to be. This is how we're moving. This is the needle that we're moving. This is what we moved so far. This is areas we're doing really well in. This is areas where we need some improvement. Everyone needs to see that because not only do you need to see the big picture, but you need to understand what role you and your program and your department and your course play in that big picture. Because like I said, y'all are, we couldn't do what we do without you. We couldn't. 
administration could all show up one day, but what are we gonna do by ourselves? Yeah, college wouldn't run without everybody else. So they have to see, everybody needs to know where are we in terms of the big picture and how are what you doing moving that big picture forward? As usual, you've set me up perfectly for the next one <laughs> without even planning it. Um, as president of Jackson State Community College, you would be uniquely positioned to communicate the college's vision for the future to potential donors and the community. How would you take the lead on fundraising initiatives for the college? Um, as I mentioned, the president is the chief fundraiser. Uh, and, and there's two, this is two pronged, uh, in my opinion. I think that um, the president is not only the face of the college, but I, what, should I be chosen to be president, would be honored to tell your story. We talked about this. It's storytelling, right? I want to back up first and let you know, we talk about the college as a pillar of the community. And I'm going to let you know, after being here for a year and knowing this community and being involved in this community and loving this community, the community loves Jackson. The community knows that Jackson is a pillar, right? And you know how I know that? Because everyone I talked to went to Jackson. I went to the AMP on Friday night and I met a young lady, someone introduced me to her and she's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I work at Jackson State. Oh, I went to Jackson State, right? And so the roots run deep here. The roots run very deep. There is a huge connection between the college and the community. And people understand it's a pillar. But what we need to help people also understand is that community colleges are economic engines of change for the community, right? And they are what makes socioeconomic mobility possible for the community. That's the importance. That's what's important about this community college. Next thing they need to know is what are we doing here? What are we doing here? They gotta get informed. You gotta inform them first about what we're doing. What's our story? What are we doing? What new initiatives do we have going on? What new programs? How are we meeting the demands of the industry? How are we meeting the needs of the community? What are we doing? And again, post pandemic, where do we fit in this new world of education, right? What's our identity look like in this new world of education? How do we fit in to the pipeline? Then after we tell them, once we get them informed, then we have to get them interested, right? You have to get them super interested. Oh my gosh, so you work at industry? Have you heard about our AMT program? We have this great co-op program. I went to, where did I go? Oh, the strawberry festival. The strawberry festival. And I met the plant manager from um, Rhinehurst. Is that the name of it? Did you call him? Yeah, you called him. <laughs> anyway, we're sitting at the table. He's like, I just... I'm new to Jackson. I'm, I'm new to Jackson. He's like, well, I'm working here at Reiner's Manufacturing. And he goes, I'm looking for an apprenticeship program. I was like, what an apprenticeship co-op program? And he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And I was like, here's my card. And let's do this. And I was like this. And I was like, I don't know what else to tell you about it. I said, but Kathy's your woman. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I put Kathy in touch with him. And that's what we do. We tell people what we're doing. And we get excited. And we make the connections. And so he's interested in apprenticeships and co-op programs and manufacturing. Now he gets interested. Now we want to get involved. Does he become one of our co-op members? That's what we want, right? If his company becomes a member of our co-op and part of our AMT co-op, now he's involved. He's involved with what we're doing here at the college. And once you become involved, then you start talking to him a little bit more and we think about ways that you can get invested. How can you invest in the community college, right? And the same thing happens with the foundation. As chief fundraiser, I gotta be able to tell the story to the foundation. The foundation needs to know what we're doing. The foundation has to be informed, right? They have to be informed with what we're doing and be involved. The foundation needs to know, what are our priorities? What are our goals? What are we trying to do here? And what do we need to get that done, right? And tell that story, show the data, right? 
here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's where we are. Here's what we need. Here's all these different things. Let's start setting priorities where we can think where we can meet, uh, enlist donors, call donors, talk to donors who may have an interest in this, reach out to donors, connect with them, create a relationship, keep that relationship going. It's not a one and done, right? You can't just talk to them once. Keep the relationship going, right? They're a part of our community. They're a part of us, yeah? Talk to local corporate leaders. Hey, you got a need, you have an interest. You're going to need some skilled workforce. We have a new workforce building coming to campus. Let's talk about it. I think we have a mutual interest here, right? And tell the story. Bring them to the campus. Look at it. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're thinking we're doing. This is where the building's going to be. We want you to be involved. It would be great, right? Get them excited. So that's how I would uh, approach fundraising. That was the last question okay. and um, we're great on time, but I'll just give you a minute to maybe um, give some final remarks or final thoughts or anything you feel like you missed, you didn't get to say. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is my community now, right? Um, this is home. I feel like this is home. I felt accepted the day I got here. I felt like I fit right in. Uh, it's sort of that same feeling I felt, felt when I showed up the first day at the community college in Dallas, right? I have purchased a home here. I am here for the long haul. And I am completely invested in this college and this community. And I can see, I can clearly see where this college can be in three to five years from now. I can clearly see the opportunities that are coming and how we can poise ourselves to take advantage of those opportunities and be ready. This community is going to change. It's going to change for the better. It's going to change fast, right? I saw this with BMW in Greenville. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Ford's in Haywood County. BMW was in Greenville. Our college was in Greenwood. The next guy. And we had plenty to do, lots to do to meet the needs of our local industry and our community and the growth, not just in industry, but all the other growth that's going to happen in terms of food and retail and tourism and hospitality and all those different areas, business. So there's a lot to work to do here. My sleeves are rolled up. I've been working since the day I got here. I feel like I should be vested in the retirement system already. I'm not, <laughs> I feel like I should be. <laughs> uh, but there's been, there. but I love it. I love it. I love every minute of it. Um, my, my family, to their chagrin, probably hears a lot about Jackson State. I talk incessantly about what's going on here and what we can do and what we can do to make it better and exciting things that are happening. And you won't believe this and you won't believe Anna took these students to, to, to study abroad and look at this picture and I'm showing them on Facebook and you won't believe what we've done with the TLC. And this is Tammy. And like, I just share everything with everyone. It's so exciting. And, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. I wanna be a part of it. And I wanna, I, I, I would be honored to lead this college into the future. Thank you on behalf of everyone here in person and online. I just thank you, Dr. Lopez, thank for you. coming before us today and giving thoughtful answers um, infused with your passion <laughs> and um, appreciate your time and interest in um, the, the position of president of uh, Jackson State Community College. And I also just want to take a moment to say thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be your host today. Um, so. I'll hand it back over to Henry. Well, I will say my closing uh, comments. So as part of the PERT search process, Chancellor Tidings and the Tennessee Board of Regents have uh, put together a survey. It's completely anonymous. It closes August 3rd. So keep that date in mind. You have until then to submit your, uh, your thoughts, opinions, and uh, collective comments. Um, you can get to this at the Tennessee Board of Regents website uh, underneath the presidential search section, or you can go to jscc.edu forward slash president search. This concludes our open forum. For those of you here, if you'd like to meet with Dr. Lopez after this, we have refreshments down in the downstairs lobby. Thank you.